So um, if you've grown up in church or you spent a lot of time in church on Christmas, you probably know the Christmas story pretty well. And if you know the story well, you probably maybe don't hear it like it's the first time you've heard it. Maybe you've lost some of the wonder, some of the spectacle of the story. It's really easy for it to just simply wash over you and for the details to become sort of unimportant. They're poetry, but they're not shocking. They're not scandalous. And I think that we can hear it fresh if we open up our imagination to the story. I think it's helpful for us to try to imagine ourselves as characters in the story, to try and imagine what might they be feeling at this time? What's their experience? And if we do that, maybe we can see things in a fresh way. So this evening, I want to quickly just meditate on what it must be like for the shepherds. The shepherds are a unique group of people because they're kind of the people who have been burned out on religion. You see, um, Jerusalem, the capital, it has a bunch of surrounding area that's been given to the Levites for pasture lands for their flocks. The Levites, the priestly caste, they have to offer sacrifices every morning and every evening. And so they need kind of sizable flocks of sheep in order to sustain all those sacrifices. And so the land around Jerusalem, and Bethlehem is part of that, has been set aside for grazing their sheep. And so many scholars believe that the uh, shepherds to which the angels appear are actually the shepherds who are looking after the flocks that are destined to become sacrifices at the temple. So their livelihood supports the religious system of their day, but they're not welcome in the temple. First of all, people don't like shepherds very much. They have a bad reputation. Apparently, they have a, a way of confusing mine and thine. Um, shepherds don't have the time to take time off to celebrate Sabbath, and their work makes them unclean. So despite the fact that they're an integral part of the whole religious system, they're not welcome to participate in it. So they are the religiously excluded. And you can only be told so many times that you and your type of people aren't welcomed by God before you internalize that message. If you're told, God doesn't like you, repeatedly. If the culture tells you that message, what does that do to your idea of who God is? You stop caring about God. You don't want to think about religion, because religion is just a source of pain for you. And so, you just put it out of your mind, and you become a very ir irreligious person. Now, when angels show up, they always terrify people. Because you can tell, when angels show up, the first thing that they have to say is, fear not. Now, that's probably maybe a little stuffier than perhaps the expression should be. Um, it might be, stop freaking out. Because when an angel shows up, people are terrified every time because the angel has to say, don't be afraid. And when, that's when it shows up for godly people. When he shows up to the kind of people who think that God doesn't like them very much, I imagine that the terror level is even higher. And so these, these uh, shepherds, when an angel shows up, they probably think they're goners. But then the message that the angel has is as surprising as the fact that an angel showed up. The angel says to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you Good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You'll find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army of angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among people with whom he is pleased. The angels are delivering this news First, to the religiously excluded. And imagine it was today. It wouldn't be shepherds abiding in the, in the hills with their flocks by night. It would be like crack dealers in the red light district or something like that. By appearing to these guys first, the angel is speaking of the universality of the message. Jesus is good news for everyone. Now here, I think our modern translations fail us somewhat. Because the Greek here is a little bit ambiguous when it says, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among people with whom God is pleased. Many translations make it sound as if it's saying peace to the kind of people that God likes. Because the ambiguity could read that way. But I don't think that makes any sense. I think it's the King James that says, uh, glory to God in the highest and peace uh, on earth among men upon whom his favor rests. 
Instead of saying peace to the people that God likes, it's saying peace to people because God likes them. Because you see, if God was picky, these aren't the people that he'd be telling. If God was proclaiming good news to people who are the kind of people that God's favor would rest upon, if God were this sort of, of God, then he'd be going to the religious. He'd be going to the priests, he'd be going to the pious, not these, these impious people who want nothing to do with religion. By appearing to them, he's saying that this is for you. God's favor extends to them as well as to everyone because it has nothing to do with what they've done. God sends Jesus not as a response to our piety, not as a response to how well behaved we are. He sends Jesus as a gift of pure grace, unmerited favor. There's nothing you can do to earn it, and there's nothing you can have done to not earn it. So if you're a pious person, Jesus is God's gift for you. Amen. And if you're not a pious person, if you've been burned by religion and you don't know anything about this, Jesus is God's gift to you. Jesus shows us that God loves saints and sinners alike. Later in Jesus' life, he's criticized for spending time with sinners. And he responds, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I'm not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. So Jesus came for you. No matter if your past is sketchy, no matter if your present is sketchy, Jesus came for you. God's willingness to forgive you has nothing to do with how you've behaved. You can't earn it. It's all grace. It's all because of who he is. John tells us that God is love. Love is his essential characteristic. If you boil love down into something, it is God. And so God graciously seeks you out because it is his nature to do so. You know, Jesus' impulse is to love and forgive everyone. When he's being crucified, Jesus prays that the Father would forgive the very people who are torturing and murdering him while they are in the act. If he can forgive that, he can forgive you for whatever you've done. So tonight, if you feel like a shepherd, if you feel burned out on religion, please understand that it is not, that, that that is the sin of religious people, not the sin of the God whom they worship. Jesus has come to be with you. He's given everything in order that you can be reconciled to God. And maybe you're not so sure about God because you've always seen God as an angry God on a hair trigger waiting to smite people for the slightest infraction. I get that. I don't much like that God either. But Jesus tells us that if we have seen him, we've seen the Father. Jesus is the perfect revelation of who God is and who God always has been. And so you might not like God as you've seen him portrayed. But if you see this God in a manger who opens himself up to come and be with us and, and not just with us in our lowest, he comes and becomes a nobody. If you see this God on the cross forgiving everybody, even the people putting him to death, just so that we have the opportunity to be forgiven. Then you see who this is. And maybe you can't love hair trigger God, but I believe if you see God revealed in Jesus Christ, this is the kind of God that I can love. And maybe he's the kind of God that you can love too. The gift is open. The invitation is to all. All you have to do is receive it.